Most churches in most contexts in North America, a lot of people come as consumers of the religious goods and services there when the Bible teaches them to be co-laborers in the gospel mission. God is raising up a new generation of leaders from his church. They will restore the places long devastated. You know, we've been talking about restorative mission, about running towards the runes. We've heard from Pastor Q, we've heard from Heather, we'll hear from others and have heard from others, but I'm so glad that you're here. And I'm also so thankful for the, for the faithful work of Prison Fellowship, now led by Heather, doing such a great job as well. Can we just thank them for their great work in Austin? Yeah. So it's good to be here. I, of course, I live in California, um, and so I, I flew in for this because I, I just really do believe in the good work that Prison Fellowship is doing. And yet, the reality is, is I'm probably in some ways you're sort of preaching to the choir. You want to avoid preaching to the choir. I can get up before you and say you should be involved in restorative ministry. I can get up before you and say you should be involved in you know in the in partnering with the church behind the walls. There's a hundred things that I could say that you would probably nod your head to, but I probably don't need to persuade you. In this. So I'm going to try to, you know, we talked a little bit and kind of, kind of unpacked a little bit of how we best think about how we, how we share today and super helpful from the team here. And I want to talk some about how do we engage more of God's people, actually maybe even how do we engage all God's people in restorative mission? How do we engage all God's people in restorative mission? And, and is that a goal? Is that an aspiration? Should we work towards that? What does that look like as well? And so I want to do that from 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. If you have a Bible, take it out or Turn one on, and let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to look at really four things. I'm going to tell you my outline before I even share it. My outline is really simple. All have gifts God intends all to use for which he empowers us to bring God's glory. And I think part of the challenge is, is you know the beauty and the power of engaging in God's restorative mission, but a lot of other people who have actually been changed by the very power of that gospel don't know what it's like to use their gifts for the advance of that kingdom and the work of the that mission. So I want to encourage you to encourage others to engage all of God's people in restorative mission, including in some ways adjusting our approach to engage all different kinds of people. So, okay. So we're going to look through this. Thank you for Karen working through with me on how to kind of share some of these things as well. So let's look at four things. If you're a note taker, these are easy to jot down. They'll also be on the screen behind you. Okay. So, cause here's what we know. First of all, we know what the Bible teaches and first Peter chapter four, it's going to be our text. It's going to help us with that. But number one in our outline is all have gifts. Now that's a very important beginning assumption that is based upon the teaching and the text of scripture, but actually shapes the way we think about restorative mission and how God's people join him in his mission. Because I believe that we're blessed to use our gifts as you already are. Again, this is the room of people that are, but with also with the blessing comes the stewardship not just of your gifts, but the gifts of others. So at my church, at Mariner's Church, I'm the teaching pastor of a church out in California called Mariner's Church. At my church, we're, we're very engaged with prison fellowship. We're very engaged in ministry to incarcerated persons and more. And so for us though, we think of it's a privilege and our responsibility, not just to ourselves to be engaged and involved, but actually to engage more and perhaps all of God's people in God's mission. Let's look at the text. It says this in 1 Peter chapter 4. It says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. So let me unpack that text just a little bit. It says, each of you. Now, this is an important beginning, or every one of you. So it begins with a totalizing phrase that actually points to all of God's people right now. But here's the thing. We all know that from the churches from which we come, that all of God's people are not using their gifts. As a matter of fact, statistically, I actually do a lot of statistical research. I used to run something called Lifeway Research. And statistically, what we know, let me quote a few stats, right? Because every time I quote a stat, an angel actually gets its wings. So let me quote a few stats. <laughs> so we surveyed 7,000 churches across North America, and here's what we found. The majority of people in the majority of churches are unengaged in meaningful ministry or mission. So in other words, most people who come to church 
come to experience something. Maybe we might say they come for the show, though that could be kind of a, I don't mean to say that in sense that all churches are putting on a show, but a lot of people, they do come for the show, but they don't stay for the serve. And so like at my church, my, you know, my church people, it's a wonderful church. We've got wonderful worship. We've got uh, our pastors does a wonderful job preaching. So, so how then do we live into this verse that says each one of you or each of you? Now, maybe it doesn't mean that. So I look to the Greek and I look, what does it mean in the Greek when it says each of you? Here's what it means in the Greek. It means each of you. <laughs> so it's not like a little wiggle room in the original language. It says each of you should use whatever gift, and the gift here is singular, most scholars point to actually meaning the gifting of the Holy Spirit, should use whatever gift you have received. Now, I'm not trying to sound like a preacher when I say received. I'm trying to emphasize the past tenseness of the word. So uh, when you were without Christ, you hadn't received uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, but now being in Christ, you've received uh, past tense, and each of you should use whatever gift you have received, uh, past tense, to serve others. So the call is all have gifts, yet the majority of people in the majority of churches are not using their gifts. Now, again, it's, we also know it's different often in, 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 in the church inside the walls, right? Where, where there's often an engaged, and, I, and that's one of the ways I think we can learn. We can learn from and be challenged by the body of Christ and all of its different expressions, because the reality is, as you go to most churches in most contexts in North America, a lot of people come as consumers of the religious goods and services there. And if you distribute it well in a way that they like, they like the music, they like the preaching, they'll keep coming. But they come as consumers of religious goods and services when the Bible teaches them to be co-laborers in the gospel mission. So the majority of people in the majority of churches are not using their gifts. And instead, they're often passive spectators rather than active participants in the mission of God. Again, they come to watch the show rather than to join in the serve. Now, why is that? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Let's, um, you know, let's, let's talk about the, maybe the way we build our buildings, right? So we're here at Church of the Highlands, and, um, and I, let's look at how this building is built. Now, now again, they are wonderful, wonderful hosts. I texted uh, Pastor Chris Hodges last night, just thanking him for the wonderful hosting. So you got to hear all of what I say. Don't get mad before you hear the rest of it. But like buildings like this, well, let's talk about some of the unintended side effects, right? When you build churches like theaters, don't be surprised when people act like showgoers. Now, someone just texted Pastor Chris and said, did you, did you hear what he said? Did you, did you hear what he said? You say, but here's the thing, right? They get the message, right? Right, I'm up here, I'm on an elevated platform and the people who lead the worship and the people who do the preaching, they're almost like a special category. And so your job's not to, not to use your gifts, your job is to listen to me, use my gifts. And so when you build churches like theaters, don't be surprised, people act like showgoers. And yet almost every church we've built looks like a theater of some sort or another. Now, some of you like, you like want to say, well, you know, the big churches, they, they put on a big performance. Here, here's the thing, right? Because people love to criticize big churches. So in our research, you know what we found? There was no statistical difference based upon the size of the church and the percentage of people serving in that church. People just like to, they like to come for the show but not be involved in the serve. And sometimes the show's small and off-key, and sometimes the show's big and it's got smoke machines. <laughs> But it's human nature, right? So when you build churches like theaters, don't be surprised people act like showgoers. You say, well, Ed, what's the alternative? We get more than 50 people. What's the alternative? And I, I don't have an alternative. I just wanted to complain about the current situation. <laughs> I'm like your church members. You know, I just bring you the concerns. And actually, I do think, I mean, this is a wonderful, wonderful setup, wonderful building. I think it's great. And thank you so much for the Church of the Highlands for hosting us. But my point is there are unintended consequences, even in the buildings. Or how about the language that we use, right? So like I'm a member of the clergy, right? I am ordained to the gospel ministry, right? So I'm a pastor and some churches they'll call me reverend. In the American South, they call me brother. Now I grew up outside of New York City and the brotherhood was the mafia. So it's... <laughs> So when I was living in Tennessee, people kept calling me Brother Ed. I was like, I, I don't, I'm not with them. I am not with the mafia. <laughs> but you know, here's the thing. Even our language, like I'm clergy. So I'm clergy right now. I'm clergy over here. How many, of you are, how many of you are clergy, ordained to the ministry? Just raise your hand. All right. All right. And how many of you are, are lay people? Just raise your hand. Just, 
Now, if you're clergy, look down at them. Just take a moment and look. <laughs> no, 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 no. But that's the way sometimes we think, right? Right? So I mean, think about it. I'm clergy, so I'm clergy right now. What do lay people do? They lay around. And that unhelpful, unbiblical distinction actually leads to the idea that even as we seek to engage in restorative ministry, it's only real ministry when the pastors are leading it. But the reality is in most churches are going to be engaged in ministry, partnering with the church inside the walls. It's actually going to be people who are not clergy are going to do that. And so how do we empower people to do these things? How do we want them to be co-laborers rather than consumers? And that means each one has received. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, I'm so glad that Ed's going to talk about the lazy people that aren't here. <laughs> Those lay people are laying around, but you're here. You're like all in, but don't, I don't want you to hear that because what I'm asking you to do is actually to go back with a bit of a different attitude that it is a calling for each one. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. And we are serving the church of Jesus Christ poorly when it has become normal for the majority of people to show up week after week after week and not use their gifts for God's restorative ministry. So I want to encourage you, you to empower people. If you're a pastor, many of you are pastors and church leaders, empower your people for engaging in restorative ministry. Maybe adjust our approach that it gives freedom to people. You know, one of the great things, what we, we often casually just call prison ministry, right? One of the great things is just how many people can be engaged and involved in ways that are empowering to them, but are deeply meaningful to people who are incarcerated. I mean, I, I can't tell you, I mean, years and years ago, we just, someone just started writing letters and almost, almost like anybody can write a letter and then write a letter back and then write a letter back and then go back and forth. And so it empowers people. And for us to say, what does it look like? Because we all know what's going on. God's doing some special things and we need an inside out revival. We know that. But the reality is part of what we've got to do is awaken the church. So I'm, I, want to, I don't want you to leave here, at least my session today, and say, man, this kind of ministry, let me just use the generic term, prison ministry, though I don't think we're ministering to prisons, we're ministering to people, I'll, I know all those things. So, but let me just say that I don't want you to leave here saying that Ed Stetzer came to talk about how prison ministry was important. I want you to hear that Ed Stetzer would encourage you to take the word of God back and the power of the Holy Spirit and invite more people to join Jesus on his mission, including in prison ministry. Yeah. Are you tracking with me? Yeah. So number one, all have gifts. Number two, uh, two, God <laughs> intends, counting is not my strength. Uh, number two, God intends all to use. Just building on that, right? God intends all to use, right? Again, because I think with blessing comes stewardship, not just of your gifts, but the gifts of others. And if I can empower you to do one thing, it's to go home and invite God's people to join you in this important mission of restorative mission work. So here's what it says in 1 Peter chapter 4, the second part. It says, as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Now, depending on what Bible translation you have, this is the NIV, but the, I think the uh, CSB says managers. So it's steward or manager, right? As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So people are called to steward their own gifts. And statistically, we actually know that most people are not. So we could talk about that. But it's also our call to help steward the gifts of the body of Christ. Now, here's the thing I don't want you to miss. Whether you want it to be true or not, every person who's been born again by the power of the gospel, who's been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, every person is now a manager or a steward of that gift. So it's a question of whether we're a good steward or a bad steward. And I think if I could say this graciously and lovingly, I think the church of Jesus Christ is not stewarding well the gifts of all of its people. And I think restorative ministry is a place where we can deploy more God's people in mission. So um, I first became a manager when I was uh, 19 years old. I became a manager at the Burger King. And I worked at Burger King, right? I worked in, and one day the manager, the store manager came in and he said, Ed, we want to make you a manager. I was 19 years old. Now, there were words before the word manager, assistant, assistant and knight, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> I was an assistant to the manager. I was assistant night manager. <laughs> but that meant for two hours every day, from 12 a.m. to 2 a.m., I was in charge of the Burger King. It was me and the fry guy, and I ruled over him with an iron fist. <laughs> Let's get those fries hot and ready. 
But I didn't like own the Burger King. Davgar Enterprises, a, a franchisee did. I didn't own the Burger King. Matter of fact, uh, I, I worked for my good, but it was also for the benefit of the customers and the benefit of the company, right? So that's what managers do, right? So we've been gifted with the Holy Spirit. And now it says with God, faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So now it goes to plural. So now it starts talking, pointing us to gifts. So I've been gifted with and by the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit at conversion, by the Holy Spirit through spiritual gifts in various forms. So my job is to be a good steward or manager of my gifts. But if I'm in the body of Christ with other people, our job is to be a good steward and manager of their gifts. And it's not just for them, though it is for them. It's for God's glory, for their good, and for the good of others. And here's the thing. If you're a, like a lead pastor, some of your senior pastors, you know, the terms have changed now. Now, we're, now everyone's a campus pastor. We didn't have campus pastors when I was a kid. Now we got campus pastors and executive pastors. Who made that up? But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> Not that it's great if you're an executive pastor, but here's the thing, right? So <laughs> we've got all these kinds of people with all these different kinds of gifts. And what I'm trying to exhort you to is every member on mission. And part of what you and I have to do is to go back to our settings and say, we believe that every member is a minister and every member is on mission and again, and to say to a lot of people who think that their job is to pay and pray and kind of stay out of the way, and that's not their job. So if you're a pastor, you don't want a congregation filled with people who are customers of the religious goods and services, because they will come, they'll come for decades and they'll not do anything. And they'll just eventually, the customers eventually become critics and you'll end up with a church full of knowledgeable religious people not living on mission. And I just want to tell you, if you've been around a lot of knowledgeable religious people not living on mission, that's a nightmare assignment. But instead, if we can acknowledge that God intends all of us to use their gifts and we steward one another's gifting, if you're a pastor, church leader, minister of missions, you already know that's what you want. But part of what I'm saying is you actually have to lead differently to get there. You actually lead differently to get there, right? How are we discipling people to actually use their gifts to join Jesus on mission? And if you're already engaged with Prison Fellowship Partnership, how do you move beyond angel tree to like second chance church? How do you, how do you help people to engage in practical ministry, right? How do you help people to, uh, to, to re-engage into society? How do you help your church to have an ongoing relationship with those who are incarcerated and more? So, so again, one of the ways we do that is help all of God's people use their gifts for God's glory, their good, and the good of others. Are you tracking with me? Yes. Number three. Okay, number one is all have gifts. Number two is God intends all to use. Hopefully by that point, we agree that all of God's people have been gifted. Now, here's the thing. At that point, people always say to me, well, are you saying that everybody should be using their gifts all the time? I'm really not saying that fully because I think there are times and seasons that people are going through difficult journeys, right? They, they need time to heal. They need time to, to be ministered to, right? Um, but I'll give you an example. We had a couple in our church, and they had two kids, and they decided not to have any more kids for whatever reasons people decide not to have any more kids. So, but one thing led to another, and she was pregnant again. And so they went to the uh, sonogram, right? And the, uh, the, the, the sonogram tech said, hey, I'm going to go get the doctor, which is always makes you a little nervous when somebody says that. And so they, he jokingly said, well, as long as it's not twins, we're fine. So, so the doctor came in and kind of looked and said, and he made the joke again, you know, as long as it's not twins, nervously, he joked, we'll be fine. The doctor said, well, it's actually not twins. It's, it's actually triplets. <laughs> and on one day, several months later, they went from a, man-to-man -man defense to a zone defense for the rest of their lives. <laughs> they loved Jesus and they were serving in the church before that. And I want you to know, I didn't show up up in their house and say, hey, how are you doing? Where are your spiritual gifts? How are you using them for God's glory? You're good in the good of others. We just came and brought them food and casseroles and watched the kids. <laughs> Now, the problem is, right, we want to be a church like that, but the problem is, if it's true that the majority of people in the majority of churches are not using their gifts, it looks like most people think they just had triplets when they just want to be customers. And I want to invite you to invite them to something different, something more, to use their gifts for God's glory, their good, and the good of others. Number three, for which he 
empowers us. So Peter's writing here, and he's writing to the Christians in the diaspora, he says, and then he says this, he writes this, if anyone speaks, they should do as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. Now, it's two broad categories, speaking and serving, and there are actually three places in the New Testament that list spiritual gifts, and there's, I think I count 18 or 19 of them in all, but they don't actually match, which is interesting to me. The spiritual gifts lists that are in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4 don't actually match. So sometimes people put them together on one big list, but I, I don't think that the Bible is listing all the ways that God gifts his people. I think the Bible is listing many or some of the ways God gifts his people. But the reason I tell you this is that here he gives two broad categories, speaking and serving. And those are two broad categories that you can engage people in restorative miss, miss, mission, right? Because all believers are chosen, gifted, and called for God's glory, their good, and the good of others. But a lot of them don't know it, or a lot of them have been overlooked for God to use them in powerful and significant ways. And I love the overlooked in my next uh, in my, the breakout session today, I'm going to talk about small groups, and I'm in a small group, and, uh, and I love my small group at Mariner's Church because there's a couple of new believers in there, and they're just finding the get, no one asks them, but now people are like, you can use your spiritual gifts, and, and you can get deployed for ministry and mission, and we're a large church, so you can get overlooked, but you don't have to be. You can get engaged and involved, and people that maybe might surprise you to use their gifts, and I think when it comes to restorative mission, there's so many ways that so many people can be engaged. It's a broad table to set. Because sometimes people get overlooked, but God's not overlooked them. He's gifted them for his glory, their good, and the good of others. And I think everybody, even the world knows there should be a place where the overlooked and maybe the unappreciated actually can shine and make a gospel difference. I, I think I saw that a few years ago. Um, remember that YouTube video that went viral from uh, America's Got Talent, um, and this woman, uh, she, she, she came onto the stage, and uh, she kind of, she, as she walked out, they, people started laughing at her as she walked out. She didn't sing a note, she didn't say a word, but she just walked up there, she stood up there as they laughed at her. Remember her? Susan Boyle's her name. Remember that? And they kind of, you know, laughed at her and uh, she was maybe too old or maybe didn't have the look. I don't know. But she, she got up there and you could tell the, the crowd was already, matter of fact, one of the judges would later say, we were all against you. And you could feel it. You could sort of tell it. But she got up there a little defiant and, and, uh, and then Simon Cowell started interviewing her and said, where are you from, dearie, in his dismissive way? And she kind of stumbled up from a collection of villages in Scotland, gave everyone a chance to laugh at her again because she, she couldn't clearly articulate, and she still pressed through and, and, and said, what do you want to be like? And she named a famous singer, and Simon kind of rolled his eyes. And, 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 and so, but she then, the music began to play. Da, 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 da. And as she started to sing, people rolled their eyes at the beginning of it, right? You could actually see in the crowd people rolling their eyes as the music begins to play. And then though, she began to sing. She sang, I dream a dream of time gone by. And she hit those notes. And as she did, you remember, you probably watch this. If you had a screen and you were alive at this time, you saw this video. Right? I was watching this video over and over in the living room. My wife comes in and says, who is this woman you keep watching on the internet? I said, it's all good, baby. And I'm just watching this video. And I am crying like a 10-year-old girl at a... Taylor Swift concert. I'm just crying. And I am like, because I'm like, no, this is just so beautiful. She starts to sing and, and you can just feel it. She gets stronger by line, by line, by line. And then soon people were on their feet. Like the whole crowd stands up on its feet and they're cheering and, and they're clapping. And, and if you're not crying, your heart's hard. And even Simon Cowell, even Simon smiled and the world rocked on its axis for just a moment. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah. Of course you do. You know why? Because there was something right about it. 
There's something right about a time and a moment when the overlooked and the unappreciated actually shine in the way that God had made them. And it's a talent, it's a little different than gift, but she shined at the way that God made. You had to stand up and cheer. And what I want to say to you, sisters and brothers, is your congregation are filled with people that if you will deploy them for God's good, glory, their good and the good of others, they'll be used by God, their lives will be changed, and it'll make a difference in the world. And the kind of ministry that we're inviting people here at Restore is the kind of ministry that all kinds of people can step into. The kind of people who walk through broken times in their life or the kind of people who think they've never experienced brokenness in their lives. This is the kind of place where we set a broad table. And people know there's a time and place. There should be a time and place when the unappreciated and the undervalued shine, just like Susan Boyle did. For some, that's a shocking moment on YouTube. For us, it should be life in the kingdom of God. So if you want to join in restorative mission, don't just do it, but invite people to do it with you and find people that maybe have been overlooked, but they'll be used for God's glory, their good, and the good of others. Okay. Now, number four, and finally, and I'll close with this. You know what it means when a guest speaker says, I'll close with this? Actually, absolutely nothing. <laughs> well, so what are you going to do? You're going to leave? You're going to throw me out? Um, <laughs> But I just think that the moment we're in is a messy moment in our culture. The moment we're in, though, doesn't pause the mission we're on. And I think that if God's people would show up, showing and sharing the love of Jesus in the kind of restorative mission that we're calling people to today here, that would change the world in which we live. Now, mind you, it doesn't make all the problems go away. And I don't really know the future. You know, I don't know the future of your church. I don't know the future of the church in America or beyond. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I actually work at a nonprofit organization, so I don't know. <laughs> That's probably the only thing you're going to remember out of my whole talk today. And you're going to use that on your next talk. But I just think that if we do these things, let me go through the outline, right? All have gifts God intends all to use for which he empowers us to bring God glory. I want God to be glorified in your life, in your church, and in the restorative mission in which you engage. Let's look at the passage. It's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. It says this, so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. In all things. Because to him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. I want you to know that I love the church. I really, God has chosen the church to make known his manifold wisdom in the world, Ephesians 3.10 says. I'm involved in the church. I, I serve as the dean of the Tablet School of Theology, but we want to draw close to the church. I love the church, so I love where most of you are engaged in serving or helping to mobilize, right? I think it really does deeply matter. One of the challenges, though, in the church that I've talked about is the cons customer or consumer mentality. And one of the challenges I think sometimes is, is that we've all learned how to show videos in church, and videos often make us feel good about things our church is doing that really we ourselves should be doing. You know, I'm at a large church. We can put videos up there and say, let's look at the awesome things we did. And we support, and we do support those things that were for them. I'm just naive enough that when the Bible says each one should use his gift to serve others, that that's something good for people. It's for God's glory, their good, and the good of others. That's something good for people. So that in all things, it says in verse 11, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So I want to invite people in to glorifying God in their gifts, in their mission, and in their ministry, because God wants his glory. He's concerned about it. He created you for it. He gifted you to it. And I, I think at the end of the day, my exhortation to you really comes down to this. Again, how do you avoid preaching to the choir, right? Not that there's anything wrong with preaching to a choir, right? So I like choirs. <laughs> I'm not mad at choirs. Um, I think the way you do that is you encourage them to do something else, not something more, but something else. Because I can encourage you to do more. I could say you should be engaging more. You should be going to the facility more. You should be mentoring more. And all that's good and true. But I actually want you to bring someone else. And it's for their good because they have been overlooked and unappreciated. And I've seen the joy of a grandmother who started a letter writing ministry. I've seen the joy of somebody saying, I want to partner and engage 
and help someone re-engage into society. I've seen the joy of accountants coming alongside and going to help this person as they come out and get, get them on well, right track financially. I've seen the joy of the mentoring groups, and I've seen the joy of what God's doing inside the walls that we can partner in as well. Why is there a joy in that? Because it brings God glory, and we were created to bring God glory. So my encouragement is this. Is it's kind of a big encouragement, because I, I know you can't fix it all, but probably the largest group of you here in this room are ministers of mission or ministry or some role like that in your church. So I actually think there may not be any more important role in the life of the church than yours. The problem is this. Sometimes the church wants to delegate to you what God has called them to do. Well, you go, go do it in our name. Our church has a good name. We make much of the name of Jesus. We're for that. And I want to ask you not to receive the inappropriate delegation from somebody else. I'll give you an example. I was the, uh, well, I lived in Tennessee once. Um, I, there you go. There you go. I was fixing to fit in, but I had to leave. Moved to Chicago. I think I'm the only person who moved from Tennessee to Chicago that entire year. Um, but when I was in Tennessee, they did call me Brother Ed. And I was the interim pastor of a church, a traditional church, say the choir. So I was preaching to the choir, turn around every once in a while. I wore a suit and a tie. Um, and uh, at the end of every service, I would give an invitation, an altar call. There was no altar in this church. It was a series of steps, but they called it an altar, so I pretended. Um, so I would say at the end of the service, would you come? My job was to stand up on the stage. There were steps down there. It's not like this one, which is a little bit of a, there's a step, but it's a doozy. Uh, um, so there were steps down there. And so my job was to stand up there and say, would you come? Would you come? And then it was, it was a larger church. There were like these two rows. There was a row in the middle and there were N rows. And then when I got up to say that, people would go to each of those places, right? They'd go stand those places. And I called them the goalies because their job was to keep people from getting up on the steps. So they would come. And so, you know, sometimes there'd be a response and people come up, they receive Christ or they want to join the church or they want to prayer for something. So I'd get up and say, would you come? And they'd sing a song and they would come. So one day there was a particularly large response. So I kind of went over here and... There was a little bit of a line, so I went and just started to pray with people. So this young couple, uh, I knew their name, I, I know their names, but I won't say it, but this young couple came up with their little son, Johnny, and they were in line to meet with somebody. I said, let me just talk to them. So I came up and I went down there and I met with them and they said to me, Brother Ed, um, would you, uh, this is Johnny, and I knew the couple, they'd been involved in the church their whole lives, they're wonderful people, love Jesus. They said, Brother Ed, um, Johnny is ready to receive Jesus and he has some, he has some questions. I was just wondering, would you, would you like answer his questions and and pray with him to receive Jesus. I mean, what a beautiful moment. But I'm not from Tennessee. I'm a New Yorker, so I blurt. So I said, well, but no. I know it's terrible. Like, what kind of person would say that? I didn't quite say it like that. I said, I said well, why don't, why don't you guys answer his questions? And, and then we'll, I'll be there. We'll lead him to Jesus. And, and they were like a little stunned. And they were like, but he's, he's got questions. And I said, but, but he's 10. Are they like hard? <laughs> That's a New Yorker. I'm a blurter. I didn't quite say that. I didn't quite say that. So I said, but, but I mean, you guys have been Christians like, like for decades in this church. You guys are, this, you were discipled in this gospel teaching and preaching church. And I said, why don't, so it was really, it was a lot nicer than I'm making it. And so they left, but they weren't happy. They weren't happy. So they did go back and like, I, and they did tell like their Sunday school class that I didn't answer the kids' questions. And so I heard about it and they were unhappy. But then two weeks later, they came back. And I was up front and I saw them. And this time they just said to the goalie, I want to talk to the pastor. So I said, okay, here we go. I don't know if this is going to be. So they came up and I met them right there in the front. It was a true story. This is not a preacher story. This really happened. So I'm standing right there. <laughs> That's for you, Pastor Q. Okay. <laughs> so I'm standing right there. And, and they come up and I'm not sure what's going to happen because I know they expressed their disappointment in this. So I'm kind of bracing myself. I'm ready for trouble. The New Yorker and me is coming out. And they said to me, um, well, here, here's, here's what the exec said. They said, Brother Ed, I'm like, yes. We just want to thank you for not robbing us of the opportunity to pray with our son. But here's the thing. They didn't go back and tell everybody that they complained to two weeks ago. So if you're a pastor, if you're on staff, if you're the minister of missions, if you're the key leader in this thing, right? I want you not to miss this, but I'm going to use the term generically. When pastors do for people, what God has called the people to do, everybody gets hurt and the mission of God is hindered. But we've created a system 
that people now expect pastors to do what God's people are called to do. And I'm asking you to set a broad table and invite all kinds of people to join Jesus on this restorative mission to the hurting and the broken in the world and to do so for God's glory, their good and the good of others. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that by your grace and your goodness, you've redeemed us, called us by name, sent us on mission. And Father, I thank you for what you're doing here at this Restore Conference. And Lord, I pray that my small exhortation might cause us to go back and to invite others to join Jesus on mission for God's glory, their good, and the good of others. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. And amen. Can you help me one more time honor Dr. Ed Stetzer? Amazing man. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. And I want to encourage you, please subscribe to Prison Fellowship's YouTube channel. You can be on the lookout for more content all year round. Oh,